Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jonathan Ilgen to speak at Medicine Grand Rounds this morning. Dr. Ilgen is an Associate Professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine, an Adjunct Associate Professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics and Medical Education. He also serves as Associate Director for the Center for Leadership and Innovation in Medical Education, or CLIME, uh, for the UW School of Medicine. He also serves as Director for the Medical Education Research Fellowship for Junior Faculty in Emergency Medicine. Dr. Elgin earned his medical degree from the University of Southern California and then completed his house staff training and chief residency at Harvard. His postgraduate training has included several research and education fellowships, including earning a master's degree in clinical research from OHSU. After initially being on faculty at OHSU, he transitioned to the University of Washington in 2010 and since that time has demonstrated excellence in clinical care, a medical student at house staff education and research with a focus in clinical reasoning and medical education. Dr. Ilgen is distinguished as a fellow of the American College of Emergency Physicians and has previously been awarded the Outstanding Educator Award from the UW uh, Emergency Medicine Residency Program. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ilgen as he presents Clinical Reasoning Past to Present, How Experts Work Comfortably in Settings of Uncertainty. It is, uh, it is such a pleasure to be here and, uh, and to look out and see both students and uh, former students and colleagues. Um, this is a, a topic that I find really uh, meaningful to me and I'm hopeful that, that as we talk through these um, ideas around clinical reasoning, I, I can find some things that's, that are meaningful to you and we can have some good discussions around how we think and um, sort of have identities as cl clinicians. Clinical reasoning is one of those topics that's actually hard to put a name to, and actually what I'm talking about is probably going to mean a little bit, something a little bit different to each of you. We often talk about clinical reasoning with beginning, sort of, with the end in mind. You know, we line our, our walls with oil paintings of our predecessors, and we think about things that we can aspire to. So I thought I'd tell you just a little bit about a few people that are from different fields and just give you some ideas about, you know, why people thought these people were special. Uh, on your left is Joseph Bell, and some of you may have heard um, about Joseph Bell a bit because Abraham Burghese has been using him as an example of this sort of wondrous clinician when he talks about the importance of the physical exam. Joseph Bell is a Scottish surgeon, and uh, while at the University of Edinburgh, um, was sort of known for this uh, unbelievable intuition that he had about patients. He could look at patients' hands and look at their faces and look at their clothes and come up with these amazing hypotheses about what their story might have entailed without asking them any questions. He ultimately served as a preceptor to Arthur Conan Doyle, and so the, the character of Sherlock Holmes is actually loosely based on Joseph Bell and, and the kind of skills of, um, of deduction that he had. In the middle is William Halstead, who is known by many as the father of, of surgery. Um, he was one of the original founding professors of Johns Hopkins and was, was a pioneer in many, many ways, right? He was somebody who um, actually insisted that we wear latex gloves in the operating room, um, which at the time was unusual. Um, performed the first successful uh, inguinal hernia repair, the first successful radical mastectomy, just a, just a giant in his field. And on your right is uh, Miller Fisher, who is a neurologist. Um, Miller Fisher has a lot to do with what we understand about strokes. He was the first to establish the link between atrial fibrillation and, and emboli to the brain, um, the, the implications of having carotid stenosis and, and your risk for stroke. Um, many of you may recognize his name because he also is the first to name the Miller Fisher variant of Guillain Barre syndrome with the ophthalmoplegia. Um, so, in many respects, just this amazing researcher and amazing clinician, and certainly somebody who neurologists aspired to grow up to be. But when we think about people like this, it's, it's actually hard to separate who they are as a clinician and their accomplishments in clinical medicine. And, and how, what really made them special is a little bit hard to decipher. These also may not necessarily be the people you want to be like. Um, William Halstead spent most of his career addicted to cocaine um, and to morphine, which in fairness to him were legal at, those, at that time. But, you know, he was known for this very erratic behavior and not necessarily the person you wanted to spend time with. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about somebody who impacted me, just because I know that each of you has had somebody in your life or multiple people in your life and your training experiences um, that have been influential in terms of how you think about yourself as a clinician. 
Michael Shannon was, was the chief of pediatric emergency medicine when I was a, a trainee in Boston. And he was this person who all of us looked up to. He was a, um, he was a fantastic clinician. He was a world-renowned toxicologist. He was the first African-American full professor at Harvard. Um, but that, I, I sort of knew about those things, but what I really ad admired about him was his, his grace. He was just somebody who just kind of floated in and out of environments with calm and patience and, and kindness and it was with everybody. It was with patients, it was with families, it was with staff members, it was with trainees. Um, and he was somebody who we really just thought, you know, that's the kind of person I want to be in all respects, right? Um, he unfortunately, he was also a, um, a very accomplished dancer. And um, when traveling to South America um, to learn the tango, um, came back and actually had a fatal pulmonary embolism while in Reagan National Airport, which is just was devastating to all of us. Um, and so when I think about Dr. Shannon and his impact on me and impact on my colleagues, it's really more than just thinking, right? It's more than just knowledge and knowledge application. This was a human that I wanted to be like, right? He was a professional, he was kind, he was empathetic, he communicated well. So we're gonna spend a lot of this morning talking about thinking, and I don't wanna by any means minimize these other quadrants here. It's all part of the picture when we think about what it means to be an expert. Um, it happens to be that clinical reasoning is one of those topics we can draw a lot from other literature, such as psychology and sociology, anthropology, um, um, but all those other aspects of communication and professionalism are absolutely part of the, the picture of what it makes, it makes it to be somebody like Dr. Shannon. And so it turns out that even the experts, this is a paper from January, the experts still can't agree what we're actually talking about here when we say the words clinical reasoning. And so I'm by no means going to try to be comprehensive here when we talk about this topic of clinical reasoning through the ages. Um, but I thought I'd leave you with just a couple of kind of general buckets of, of fields that have sort of talked about this, this problem and hopefully some ideas that are a little bit more forward thinking about how we think about clinical reasoning in a healthcare setting um, where teams are actually how we're working together and taking care of patients. And so there's been two fairly dominant nar narratives in medicine um, around how we think. And um, I I'm, I've projected a slide of two ships passing in the night because these are largely two literatures that have not talked to each other. There's the medical decision-making literature, which is largely based on things like Bayesian probabilities and evidence-based medicine. And there's the medical education literature that has really approached this problem from more of a psychology um, perspective. And so I'm gonna hopefully give you some perspectives from both that might be useful for you. Um, and also point out some limitations of each of these different approaches. So it's important to understand where our origins of psychology begin. Um, the 1950s was both the, the origins of modern psychology as we know it, um, and it was also happened to be the time when computers happened to be kind of growing up in their prominence in our world. And so psychology was begun under, this auspice, under the auspices of finding meaning in the things that we do, making meaning of the decisions that we make, but it quickly devolved into this idea of information processing. You know, how do we think about problems like computers do and information is most useful when it limits possibilities and helps us to sort of um, gauge probabilities more effectively. And that may not actually be how we think, but that was the way that it was conceptualized. And so these two handsome gentlemen, does anybody know who these people are? Um, on your left is Amos Tversky, and on the right is Danny Kahneman, and they ultimately received a Nobel Prize for their work. But these are both um, cognitive psychologists who were um, in the Israeli army in the 1970s, 60s and 70s, um, which um, their friendship and work is documented really well in Michael Lewis's book, which I totally recommend. That's a really interesting read. Um, but they began under this idea of, of really thinking about thinking in a different way. So rather than thinking about probabilities and information processing, they, they came up with this novel idea that humans use heuristics or mental shortcuts um, to estimate probabilities rather than actually formally computing probabilities. And so I thought it might be useful for, for, for us to just sort of do one of their experiments together. Um, this is the audience participation part of the talk. Um, and so I'd like to give you one of the experiments that they did in one of their um, early studies. So Linda's a 31-year-old woman. She's single, outspoken, very bright, majored in philosophy, and as a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice and participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Okay, so you have a reasonable sense of Linda. So which statement is more likely? Linda is a bank teller, or B, Linda's a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. So who votes for A? Okay, 
and who votes for B? Okay, so that's, that's about the results that they found. It turns out that the probability of one of these things is always going to be more likely than the probability of two. And yet when you ask humans to ask, answer questions like this, about 80 to 90 percent of the time, they choose B. Right? And this is the conjunction fallacy. So this idea that sp being specific around someone's identity, specific conditions, a bank teller and an activist, um, is going to be more probable than, a, probable than a single general one. And so through experiments like this, Tversky and Kahneman were able to demonstrate that humans are actually not estimating probabilities. They're sort of trusting their gut and using these heuristics. Now, you have to be careful about the implications of this, and we're going to talk about the rhetoric that's sort of grown out of this program of research. Um, but it's the assumption of their work is that essentially we need to be probabilistic if we're going to manage uncertainty. The way that we should be managing our, our uncertainty is knowing these probabilities and using them to cope with our uh, real-world choices. And that because our, our uh, choices are based on heuristics um, and rather than formal computations, it turns out we're actually not very good at that. And as a result of that, heuristics are fallible and lead in some circumstances to bias and to errors. There's a bit of a problem in this, in this reasoning that I'd like to sort of take you through in a second. But I, this is sort of the whole underpinning of their work and a lot of the work that's been translated into medicine. So let me give you some examples of that. Mark Graber and his team have done a lot of research looking back at retros retrospectively at errors in medicine um, and looked at cases that have been flagged as something where there was a bad outcome or something did not go optimally. And when they did that, somewhere around 60 to 70 percent of the time, there's a cognitive aspect um, to that error, right? There are system uh, factors, but there are a lot of cognitive factors that are at play. Alan Kachalia did some similar work in the emergency medicine setting looking at malpractice claims and again found you know, a vast majority of them had some sort of cognitive influence, be it judgments or vigilance or knowledge that impacted the care of those patients. I want you to be a little bit skeptical about these assertions. I will tell you that all of these reviews were done retrospectively. None of them were done by the treating clinicians. And none of them calculated an inter-rater reliability for any of these assertions. So there's a little bit of storytelling here that's happening. Um, but we can get a sense that maybe there's, some, there's a problem here. And so this has really grown into this, um, this whole field around bias and error and the way that we can kind of potentially get ourselves out of that trap. And Pat Crosscare, he's written a lot about this, and I'm just going to read to you his assertion, which is that becoming alert to the influence of bias requ requires maintaining keen vigilance and mindfulness of one's own thinking. And when a bias is identified by a decision maker, a deliberate decoupling from the intuitive mode is required so that corrective mindware can be engaged um, in the analytic mode. So the idea is here, is here that we're going to have intuitions, but they're biased. And therefore, the way to get around that is to think more thoroughly, identify those biases, um, and try to circumvent that. Right? This has been the dominant narrative in our world. All of us know about the words premature closure. Right? Everybody know about that term? Most of us know, know about this term anchoring um, or availability. There's lots of biases that are in our world. And in fact, there are so many that there's no way they'll ever be able to learn any, all of these, right? Part of the challenge here, I've deliberately made these so small that you can't read them, is that many of them are directly opposed to one another. So if you fall prey to premature closure, you are, um, the sort of idea is that when the diagnosis is made, the thinking stops. The idea that you are stuck on a diagnosis and you can't get yourself back from that place. That might be one form of bias. There's also the yin-yang bias, which is literally that you're working something up the yin-yang um, in a way that you are working it up so thoroughly that you can't ever reach an endpoint. Those are directly opposed to each other. So in order to sort of know which bias you are falling prey to, you need to be able to identify that in the moment so that you have the right corrective strategy. So the question is whether that's possible. Right? I'm not by any means saying that biases aren't there. They are there, as are heuristics. But the question is, is that a useful way for us to learn? And is that a useful way for us to practice? So let me just give you a couple of examples. This is where I work, right? And we talked about Linda, right? And we, and we talked about this, this issue of probabilities, right? I'd like to give you a case from my environment. So imagine Rahim is a 40-year-old male who presents to the emergency department with multiple injuries following a car accident. On examination, he's got diminished breast sounds on the left. He's got marked abdominal tenderness, he's hypotensive, and he's tachycardic. So which one of these is more likely? Rahim has a pneumothorax, or as Rahim has a pneumothorax and a ruptured spleen, right? And so you can see pretty quickly 
that we've got a problem here, right? A may be more likely, but I'm not doing Raheem any service to just anchor on that and say, we're not gonna, there's no way he's got a ruptured spleen, right? In fact, we teach our students and our trainees very much not to do this, right? This is Occam's razor, right? What is the most simplistic solution that explains all the things in front of us, right? So this, this issue of parsimony is that sometimes in, a, in opposition to probabilities. And so, you know, when, we, when we're making high stakes decisions like the care of a patient, it's different than measuring economic probabilities of, you know, you know, the sort of order that Linda, whether she's a bank teller or whether she's a bank teller and active in the feminist movement, doesn't really have the same consequences as me missing a ruptured spleen, for example. Okay. I'd also like you to think about the ability for you to do this in the moment. So I'm going to give you a case of mine. This is a real case. And um, I'd like you to just sort of tell, you, tell me what I could do differently and tell me what, what I did wrong for, uh, for, uh, in this case. So Michelle's a 45-year-old female. Um, she's got a history of both migraines and a prior cerebral aneurysm that's been clipped and presented with gradually increasing headache of one day's duration. It was similar to her prior migraines. It began shortly after she awoke that morning and she looks very well. She's a febrile. She's got no meningismus. She's got a normal detailed neurologic examination. And so after seeing her, um, I'm convinced that she's got a migraine. She's convinced she's got a migraine. We make her feel better. We didn't do any testing. We uh, discharge her home with a plan to see your primary care doctor, doctor in two days. Totally reliable patient. So here I am in the moment, right? You're being asked to judge whether I'm making an error and whether I am biased. Or and if, if so, what bias I'm falling prey to and what I can do differently. Okay, so who feels like they're ready to make that assertion? Okay, hard to do, right? So let me give you the outcome. So Michelle's seen two days, at, two days later by our primary care doctor. She's got complete resolution of her symptoms. She gets a refill of her sumatriptan, and she's on her way. She's gonna come back a month later. So who thinks I made an error? Okay, was there a bias in play here? Okay, so this is actually not what happened. This is. Uh, my colleague called me the next afternoon to say that Michelle had been found out at home. She was pulseless, um, had resuscitation on the way to the hospital, had pulses when she got to Harborview, had a head CT showing a devastating subarachnoid hemorrhage, and she ultimately died in the ED from her cerebral edema. Same questions, right? Same management decisions. Right? This is really hard to do in the moment, and we do this a lot to ourselves retrospectively, but we forget the fact that we're only reviewing the cases where things go wrong. And so the lessons that we're learning from these cases are really potentially not terribly useful if the management strategies when things go right are exactly the same. So we actually showed this in a more experimental sense. So we designed a study uh, several years ago where we developed a, a series of cases where diagnoses were roughly equiprobable. So for example, uh, a patient had symptoms that suggested pneumonia, cough, productive of sputum, some malaise, but also suggested something like a pulmonary embolism, pleuritic chest pain, leg swelling, a family history of a thrombophilia. And then we made a management decision that was only geared towards one of those two things. So we said, your patient received antibiotics and was told to follow up two days later. In half of those cases, we gave people a correct outcome. Patient got, came back later, they were better. And in half of them, uh, we asked at that point, was there an error, was there a bias? Half of them got the opposite. Patient came back two days later, symptoms were persistent, a CT chest was performed that demonstrated a pulmonary embolism. And we randomized these cases amongst participants such that half of them got these correct diagnoses for half of the cases, and half of them got the in in incorrect diagnoses for the other half, and then they swapped, swapped and crossed over. So not surprisingly, when there was a incorrect outcome, um, there was about a five to six fold higher rate of diagnostic errors, right? If bad things happen, we think that there's a mistake. When good things happen, we don't think that there is one. Not terribly surprising. But when diagnoses were incorrect, there was twice as many biases identified. Remember, same decision, and yet half a, you know, th there's a you know, two fold increase in whether you thought that that decision was faulty um, based on an outcome that's not knowable in the moment. And then there was no agreement amongst our experts. And these were, I should mention, um, these were all generalists within the society for, to improve diagnosis in medicine. We gave them a list of these biases that they might be considering. There was an, a kappa of zero. There was no agreement about which biases were in play. Okay? So this is a real quandary, right? So if we can't identify these things in the moment, and if we do, 
we can't agree what the problem is, it's really hard to correct our, our behavior, right? And so there are some things we can learn about this field. I think knowing that we're, we think in non-probabilistic ways is actually a really useful thing to know about ourselves, right? We espouse these principles of evidence-based medicine, but in practice, a lot of this is sort of feeling our way through problems using our, our sort of gut sense, right? Heuristics can be adaptive or maladaptive depending on the setting, right? The heuristic of, gosh, we need to make everything make sense um, out of a sick patient, like the one, like Raheem, is probably an adaptive response to keep that patient safe. Um, whereas in other settings, falling prey to bias may be a problem, but it's hard to identify those things in the moment. We have to be careful about taking a lot of lessons from the Kahneman and Tversky literature because those experiments were set up to deliver errors if someone used a heuristic. I'll say that again. Those experiments were, were designed to show an error if you used a heuristic. That was how they figured out pe that people used heuristics. That does not mean that heuristics cause errors. Okay? These were rigged experiments. And so we have to be really careful about taking everything, um, the, sort of this notion that the, hum the human mind is inherently biased and faulty from those experiments. Okay. And then lastly, this, uh, this whole issue of retro retrospective reviews and hindsight, we need to be careful about salami slicing only one piece of the pie. Okay, so now we're going to transition into the, the more of the medical education psychology literature. And another influential person in this world was, was Jerome Bruner, and he wrote a book in the early 90s called Acts of Meaning. And it really sort of uh, was very critical of this idea of information processing as a, as a model of psychology. Bruner was really interested in this idea of how we make meaning of our world. You know, how do we sort of deal with all these things that we're faced with and make sense of the things that are in front of us? Um, I would totally recommend this book. It's really um, it was really influential for me in terms of just thinking about my place in the world more generally. Um, he's, a, he's very much a constructivist, sort of making sense is very much a human um, individualized decision. Um, but it's also had a huge impact on medical education. So um, George Bordage um, sort of took the work of Bruner and said, well, how do we do this in medicine? How do we take all these pieces, these puzzle pieces, and make meaning of the words that come out of our patients' mouths and the physical exams that we uh, perform them? How do we use those to actually make decisions about our patients? And so what they did was essentially um, give faculty experts um, cases and, ha and give the same cases to novice medical students and just hear them talk. You know, what, are the, what words were they using? How are they actually sorting diagnoses um, um, by using those, those stories that patients tell us and abstracting them, right? So, and what they found was that essentially, um, those who were able to uh, abstract information most effectively, acute versus chronic, intermittent versus constant, um, uh, progressive versus not progressive or constant, um, helps us to uh, to sort diagnoses in a really expert way. And so the more, that, the more semantic relationships that we had, the better abstractions that we were able to do with those data, the more diagnostically accurate experts were, right? So, you know, when I say something like acute, uh, persistent right lower quadrant pain that's migratory from the umbilicus to the right lower quadrant, all of you know what I'm talking about, right? Acute migratory, right lower quadrant, all of those are semantic qualifiers. And so this is the way that experts talk. It may not necessarily be entirely how experts think, but it's a nice approximation of the ways that we might be teaching people to more effectively sort. And so illness scripts are the ways that we are now teaching medical students and residents about how we learn about illnesses. And so all of you use this every day. And, and just to sort of illustrate this, what I'd like you to do is to just clear your mind for a second. I'm gonna show you a diagnosis and I want you to think of the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, so what came to mind? Just shout it out. Shortness of breath. Shortness of breath, okay, good, a symptom. Okay, myocardial, so myocardial infarction, the root cause. JVD, so physical exam findings. I'm looking at my medical students, I'm hoping that they're going to yell out, Frank Starling curve, right? <laughs> right? Which is not at all, not at all how, how clinicians think about this, right? But when we learn illness scripts, that's where we start, right? So, so there's a reason why we provide our students with this foundational material, because it is linked to our understanding of problems, right? Now, I will tell you, let me let you students in on a, on a little bit of a secret. When you ask faculty to explain how they got to heart failure, they're going to tell you about the Frank Starling curve, because it makes them look smart, and they know that that's 
how you're supposed to get there, but that's not at all how we think, right? <laughs> now, what I'll tell you, what's really interesting about this is that when I've asked this question in mixed, uh, mixed company, the radiologists see chest x-rays. The pediatric cardiologists see babies. Right? Some of us already start thinking about the therapies that we're, we're going to give before we even think about the diagnosis and the root cause, right? And so illness scripts are these really rich collections of information. We begin with things like uh, the Frank Starling curve and the patients that may get these kinds of problems, and then we start layering in the kinds of symptoms they might have, the kinds of physical exam findings they might have. But most importantly, the more experienced you get, are the people that you start to remember that are linked to these diagnoses, right? And what's really important to remember about this is that each of our collection of patients here is different, right? And so each of our illness scripts around acute heart failure is idiosyncratic, it is unique to us, and um, it's very powerful. It's a very powerful way to, to activate information, but it's gonna be unique to you, okay? I'm gonna come back and talk about this later, but I would say that this is probably the greatest strength of our system, and one that we don't use as effectively as perhaps we could. And again, sort of thinking about um, the kinds of findings you might have and the treatments you would have. And so when I think about experts, and when we learn about experts, um, you know, this is how we think that experts work through problems, right? We hear what the patient tells us, we acquire data both in the, in the history as well as a physical exam, we help to sort of generate a problem definition, so acute or quadrant pain, acute shortness of breath with weight gain in JVD, um, whatever it might be, and that allows us to activate these scripts, right? These scripts that are unique to us um, so that we land at this diagnosis. You'll see that things on the outside here are impacting this, how much knowledge we have, the context in which we're working, um, our experiences with that illness. And, I'll, and I want you to focus on the fact that this talk is on clinical reasoning, but I've now taken you to diagnosis, right? Those two things may not actually be the same, and in fact they're not, um, and so we'll come back to that in a little bit. And so when I come to the hospital with shortness of breath and I'm met by an expert, this is what they bring into the room with them. They've got all these different wagon wheels of illness scripts, right? So, and as, you tell, as I tell my symptoms, they're trying out one and trying out another and sorting, and that piece of data seems to fit here better than this, this piece of data, and they are you know, very powerfully sort of sorting the specific experiences they've had with prior patients into the context that's unique to me. It's also important to remember that sometimes our illness scripts look like this. Right? And I think we've all had that experience, I certainly have, where I remember being an intern, being in a room and having no idea what's going on with a patient, and having an expert walk in the room and say, that's X, Y, or Z, right? It's all based on past experiences, right? So if I take Miller Fisher, who in every estimation was an expert in his field, and I take him to the operating room, he doesn't look like an expert anymore, right? And so expert is totally relevant to your own experiences, and I think we forget that, for example, when we get calls from colleagues asking for help. Um, I'm asking for, for help because I'm lost. It may be obvious to you, but it's because you have experience with that problem um, that it's obvious to you and not obvious to them. I also want to come back to this idea of diagnostic re or clinical reasoning being diagnostic reasoning, which is very much is not. Um, and so some of you may be familiar with the work of Arthur Kleinman, who did some really nice writing about the difference between illness, which is the way that one perceives and experiences a disease, and disease. These are not the same thing, right? So reaching diagnosis is not necessarily effective clinical reasoning. Right? And illness is a very personal experience, right? It's shaped by our culture, it's shaped by the context in which we are experiencing that problem. And sort of think about um, simple problems, right? Simple problems, right? If I have simple musculoskeletal low back pain, but I can't go to work and provide for my family, that's a very different experience than if the context is different, right? If I'm a professional football player and I sprain my ankle, not a big deal for you know a emergency medicine doc all you know hobble around they can't go to work right it's a very different experience right and so remembering that disease and illness are, are different helps us to potentially think about diagnosis as something that might actually be problematic and so when we say diagnosis are we saying that this is a thing is this heart failure is this um, babesiosis, whatever diagnosis you want to la land on, the sort of endpoint of clinical reasoning, or is this a process? And I would put forth to you that it's both, but we spend most of our time thinking about the first. 
Think about case reports. When you read a case report in the New England Journal, it's all about the endpoint, right? A diagnostic test was performed and the clouds parted, the angels sung, and you came up with this rare diagnosis you'll never see again, right? <laughs> We've all, we all read those, those case reports and it feels good, right? And we emphasize this in our, in our culture. We emphasize this in our trainees, right? When we teach illness script, it's all about getting to the right endpoint. The problem is that that's not necessarily patient-centered, and that's not necessarily a, a good roadmap for students to be success successful. So let me give you some examples. So I'm, diagnostic labeling, so this idea of sort of coming up with effective endpoints, certainly has benefits, right? It helps to efficiently communicate amongst our teams, right? I, I cannot take sign up from a colleague who says with every patient, well, it could be anything. This one also could be anything, um, right? That doesn't help, right? We have to move forward, right? So there is some advantages and, and, and speed that we get out of and efficiencies out of labeling diagnoses. Um, it certainly helps to organize the teams that we work with, right? So you know, one of the ways that our, our nurses check to make sure that the therapies that we've ordered are uh, in line with the patient's problem is that they have to understand with us what the problem is we're treating, right? So that they can help to check the work that we're doing, for example. Um, and then patients certainly want these answers, right? No one wants to say it could be anything, right? Even naming it as idiopathic feels better, right? Even though we know that doesn't actually mean anything. So, so labeling is certainly something that's, that's useful, um, but it also has some problems. So the first is that, as we mentioned, this really devalues a patient's experience with an illness, right? Um, this, this sort of limits our curiosity about what their illness actually means to them. This also limits how we think through problems that are per perhaps not ready to be defined, right? So think about the problem of premature closure, right? The whole idea there is that I have, I have come to a conclusion about a problem in a way that I no longer can step back and say, wait a second, these things aren't making sense, right? So when we think about clinical reasoning in teams, labeling a diagnosis may actually limit your team's ability to, step, to speak up and say, you know what? We're not paying attention to this piece of information, and I think it's important. Right? So we have to be careful about how much emphasis we have on that, that endpoint there. Um, and then this other issue of sort of prototypical illness experiences is, is really powerful. How many of you have labeled your pa patient as a diagnosis? I'm going to go see that Crohn's disease patient in room five. Right? I'm going to go see the heart failure patient up on the wards. Right? We do this all the time. But each of those has a different experience. They're experiencing different illnesses, right? And so again, we're limiting our ability to foster rapport and curiosity in ways that actually will help the person get better. That's really what we care about. That's effective clinical reasoning. Okay, so the, other, the last thing here is I'm not so sure that diagnosis is always a great way to learn in the sense that we tell our students it's all about the diagnosis, particularly during their preclinical phases. And then they reach the wards, I'm looking at a couple of my students here, they reach the wards and all of a sudden no one's got a diagnosis. Right? It could be COPD or CHF, we're treating both. Right? And that can be really frustrating and it's really unmooring for students to feel like I have no idea what's going on with any of the patients on this team and yet somehow they all get better and they go home. Right? <laughs> um, and so we forget that. Right? Clinical reasoning is more than just making a diagnosis, it's actually caring for our patients. Right? And so our take homes are here, scripts are absolutely a helpful way, way to learn, it helps to organize our, our thinking and certainly helps with sorting um, of our information. Remembering that illness scripts are context dependent is an essential thing to, to recognize when you're in a space where you're, you've got lots of wagon wheels and others where you only have a couple of spokes, right? So this is where asking for help might be um, really important. And then this issue of patient-centeredness, right? So patient-centeredness reflects the experience that a patient has with an illness. Diagnostic labeling may come, in, come up, up, up against this in some respects if we're really focusing all about diagnosis and forgetting that there's a patient on the other side of that diagnosis that's experiencing it in their own unique way. And so I'd like to take you sort of into the future a little bit. And, and uh, part of this is I'd like to sort of just lead with this guiding thought. So there's a difference between recognizing a solution and solving a problem. Okay, let me give you an example of that. I wasn't sure how to cite this, so I cited it as the Plaza Cafe coffee cart, but may, some of you may have seen this a couple of weeks ago. So, so let me just help you think through this problem. So a man leaves home, he takes three left turns and comes home to find two men wearing masks. Who are the two men wearing masks? Raise your hand if you might, if you have an idea. Okay, just one. Okay, anybody have an idea who those masks men are? Okay, so finding the solution here is much easier when I have an appropriate context to, to layer that into. 
but without that, problem solving in this context can be really difficult, right? And so what I'd actually like to talk to you a little bit now about is this idea of reasoning in settings of uncertainty. The, the weather outside this morning actually was perfect. I was thinking on the way, this is perfect. I can't see where I'm going. That's exactly what I want to talk about today. So, so clinical reasoning is really, in many respects, this act of going down a road um, and into this abyss that you're not exactly sure where you're going, right? So the idea of, I'm treating a problem, I'm not exactly sure what this diagnosis is, but yet I know that this is a road that I should be comfortable going down, right? So how do you know you're on the right road? How do you know that you're not out, out here in the field and this is actually somebody else's problem? How do you feel comfortable moving forward even though you don't necessarily know where you're going, right? And how do we feel empowered to take actions where you don't necessarily know how those actions are going to play out. And so these are some ideas that I'd like to sort of think about with you, and I'll tell you that you're doing this every day. So let me give you an example. I'm going to talk about this idea of clinicians letting go of the need to know. So you see a patient, she's got a cough, um, she's got sputum production, she's got a fever, and she's got this chest x-ray. Okay, so anybody comfortable starting antibiotics on this patient? Okay. Anybody want to start testing for things like um, polyangiitis, granulomatosis of polyangiitis? You guys ready for that? Of course not, right? And so we take conscious inaction all day, right? There are many diagnoses that are sufficiently unlikely that we don't need to pursue them every time, right? This patient might not have a convincing story for, for Wegener's on initial presentation, but perhaps next week when things are worse and now they've got a middle ear effusion and they've got sinus tenderness and they've got other things that are leading you toward that diagnosis, perhaps you'll back up. But we do this all the time, right? Um, and, and so diagnostic certainty is not necessarily patient-centered. Think about low back pain is a great example, right? I could know every single uh, low, ba low back pain diagnosis if I wanted to with greater certainty with an MRI. It doesn't change at all how I treat that, treat that patient. And so I, you know, we diagnose patients with syndromes, this sort of idea of clinically meaningful syndromes, low back pain without red flags, right? Um, cough in a well-appearing patient. Um, and then we embark on treatment plans that may not necessarily be diagnostically precise, but if the problem gets better, it doesn't matter. Okay, let me give you another, another example. Um, there are plenty of times where we see people who look sick, right? Let me see if I can get this to play here. Um, and we have no idea why this person has such increased work of breathing, right? And at this moment, it may not actually matter whether this is pneumonia or COPD or acute heart failure. Um, there are ways that we can start this process pragmatically, this idea of pragmatic empiricism. We can start little steps in our management in ways that we can work our ways through problems, still not knowing exactly what we're dealing with. The other important aspect of this is the ability to step back continuously and say, is this fitting, is this not fitting? Right? This is the whole definition of uh, anti-premature closure, right? We are always maintaining some degree of uncertainty about the problem as a means to enable ourselves to back up and say, wait a second, is that actually what's going on here? The other aspect here is, I don't know what this is, but I have some ideas of what I could do, right? So I don't have to know the diagnosis to necessarily bring oxygen to the bedside, to bring the intubation equipment to the bedside. It also helps me to think about ways that I might get into trouble, right? So perhaps I look at this person's airway and think, gosh, this is gonna be a really difficult intubation, right? So it may be that I call up my anesthesiologist and say, hey, I don't need you now, but there's somebody here who looks sick who I might need your help with, right? I'm not doing anything at that point in terms of actual patient care, but I'm preparing against things that might get my patient into trouble. And so how do we do this in real time, and what are the lessons that we can teach our students? Um, I'm going to give you two, and then hopefully uh, give you some examples of how you can enact this in, in, in practice. And we're going to talk a little bit theoretically here. Um, but Carolyn Moulton, who's a, a surgeon, has talked about this idea of slowing down when we should, right? Not slowing down all the time, but slowing down when we should. And she talks about these moments in the operating room where things are going well, you're talking about your golf game, what your plans are for the weekend, and then, wait a second, something doesn't fit. You know, something doesn't feel right here. Okay, turn off the music. You guys need to minimize your, your side conversations. Hold on, let's step back for a second. Let's, let's uh, ex extend our incision, right? And, and what's really interesting about these slowing down moments is that oftentimes they happen without um, conscious acknowledgement. Why are we moving slowly here? 
something, something's complex. We've identified compl complexity in these uh, ways. So the idea here, again, is not necessarily that we're going to always move through slowly, right? Intuition is helpful in lots of ways. Think about um, sort of moving through an operation. There's a lot of things of, yep, that's fit, yep, that's right, yep, we're on track. But then being attentive in those moments to say, wait a second, something doesn't fit here is really, really important. The other thing that I often like to teach my students is this idea that you may not actually recognize these moments, but you almost certainly will feel them, right? I think all of us have had these moments of like, something doesn't feel right here, and I can't put words to it, but it's making me want to be cautious, right? We minimize that in medicine, right? We want to be confident and clear and move through through diagnoses and, and management plans with definitive gusto, right? But ignoring those things is actually putting your patient at risk. And so I, I would like you to think about these slowing down moments as these cues for maybe I just need more information, right? I should go back and examine the patient again. I need to take their history one more time. Maybe this is one of those problems where I don't have a lot of wagon wheels, right? I need to come back and say, am I the right person to be solving this problem or should I be asking for some help? Or even just a colleague to, to look through the same data and say, yeah, I'm at the same conclusion that you are. Um, when I work in the, the department, and Graham and Sachita and Sue can certainly attest to the fact that I call smart person consults all the time, right? Um, I'll find another colleague, say, you know, here's what I'm thinking about, what am I missing, right? And so, a lot of times it's, you know, you seem like you're thinking about this the right way, or let's go to the bedside together and look at it together. So again, this idea of I'm slowing down because something doesn't necessarily feel right doesn't necessarily mean that I'm off track, but I need to be more cautious. Okay. The second idea is this idea of planning ahead. And uh, what's really interesting is if you look at um, expertise in other domains, so Anders Ericsson has done a lot of work with chess players, master chess players, and if you look at them, at their ability to, to sort of anticipate moves, it's pretty remarkable. Master chess players can see a single board like this and anticipate every move that their opponent might make and two or three moves beyond that in ways that they can predict and, and protect their assets, right? So I can essentially move my pieces into, in a way that my, my queen is protected, for example, largely before that person even makes that move. We do a fair amount of this in medicine as well, and we think about things that are sufficiently possible, right? So think about that person with short as a breath. It is sufficiently possible that person might need to be intubated. And so in order to keep my patient safe, it is, uh, you know, it would behoove me to bring the equipment to the bedside, call for help, etc. And so this is not necessarily about diagnosis. This is just about thinking about things that might put our patients at risk and, and trying to get those, those, that infrastructure in place ahead of time. And so the, the learning point here is I want you to think about these moments when you're feeling scared and worried about somebody. Again, this is the time to speak up. Um, and this discomfort is a cue that, number one, you may be having difficulty predicting what might happen, right? And so that's a perfectly time, reasonable time to put resources in place that might be overkill, but it's because you actually are worried that you might be sort of headed toward a cliff that you're not ready for. There may be times that you can also identify events that are reasonable high probability that are beyond your capabilities, right? So if I have somebody who needs to be intubated and is 400 pounds and has just had radiation on their mouth and has no mouth opening, I'm feeling a little nervous about my ability to intubate that person without potentially harnessing some of the resources that are around me, right? Now granted, this is gonna be very different in different settings, right? We work in a place where all those resources are immediately available. It's very different if I'm in rural Montana um, and I have the same problem and I'm in the middle of the night and I'm just gonna have to get through it, right? But if we think about clinical reasoning as this idea of risk mitigation, we're really thinking about these potentially possible events. And I think the last thing is that, again, this might be a sign to you that you are at, a, at the borders of your expertise and, and asking for help is the best thing for your patient. And so the last thing I want to leave you with is this idea that clinical reasoning happens on the island. And that's the way that's been conceptualized. Those first two models of clinical reasoning around heuristics and around illness scripts make the presumption that the sort of almighty clinician with a capital C is working on this island and all of these sort of mysteries are being um, unraveled in his or her brain. And that's not at all how clinical medicine works, right? If we instead think about clinical reasoning as a system, Right? All of these people working together in service of the patients that we take care of, it helps to think, help, help us to uh, enable us to think about the strengths that each of us brings to that encounter, right? 
So when I'm asking you for help, it's not in service of me, it's in service of the patient. Because my illness script, for whatever reason, may be incomplete, because my capabilities are maybe not the right ones to keep this patient safe. And so I want you to remember this when people ask you for help because they are giving you the signal that they're feeling at the borders of their, of their confidence. The other example here that I think is really useful to think about is think about clinical reasoning within a healthcare system as a jazz band, right? All of those jazz musicians are expert. They are all playing within the same key, but they're all playing something totally different. And yet somehow if they work together, you can still have a beautiful piece of music, right? So this idea of kind of ad-libbing in our own unique idiosyncratic ways is really, I think, a powerful way to think about clinical reasoning in a, in a healthcare setting. Okay, so I promised I told you I would leave you with some lessons, and so I've got four of them here. The first is that this idea that illness scripts are providing scaffolding, they're, they're certainly a useful place to start. Um, they help us to build and communicate um, efficient, efficiently, build confidence in our diagnostic abilities. Um, but be careful that labeling may not necessarily um, lead to patient-centered care. We are lousy at judging probabilities, and, and so it's certainly worth remembering that our emotions and our cognition are not divorced from one another. If you're feeling stressed and stretched and underslept, um, all those things that happen very frequently in our world, your thinking may not be at its optimal um, ability at that point. And so we need to pay more attention to this. When things don't feel right, or when a colleague calls you and says, I'm asking for your help because I I'm worried about this patient, or things just don't seem to be fitting. I don't want you to minimize those things. That's actually expert reasoning. Um, and it's a way that people articulate their subconscious as these sort of sensations of things not working or fitting. Planning ahead keeps our patients safe, and so when others ask you for help, that's because they think that you're the right resource that your patient needs. Um, this also really emphasizes the importance of follow-up. So it's impossible to forward plan if we don't know the end of our stories. And I think particularly for our trainees that are working in very fragmented learning environments where you sign out every 12 hours or whatever it might be, if you don't make follow-up part of your educational exercise and make it a habit, you will lose out on those really rich learning experiences. Um, and then the other thing is just, just knowing that um, the consequences of your treatment decisions are only, um, only so good as you following up on them. And so in terms of thinking about making that same decision in the future, you'll never know unless you follow up. And this last idea of sort of clinical reasoning be a share, being a shared thing for all of us, we each um, contribute unique things to the service of our patients. And so just remembering that and, and, and supporting each other, um, I think, is an incredibly par important part of the system that cares for our patients. These are my people, and uh, I'd love to take some questions.